Very well. Good morning, Council. Good morning, morning, Your Honor. Morning. Good morning, Mr. Blankenhorn. Good morning, sir. Uh, you understand that you're still under oath? Yes, sir. The oath that you took yesterday applies to this testimony as well. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Proceed, Mr. Boyce. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, we have a binder to hand out. <coughs> Thanks. Good morning, Mr. Blankenhorn. Good morning, sir. Um, I'm, I'm going to try this morning to start with some things that perhaps we can agree on. Um, you agree that marriage is an important public good, as you use that term, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, could you explain for the record what you mean by a public good? I mean that it serves important public purposes, and marriage makes a distinctive contribution to society. And you believe that uh, marriage is something that benefits both the participants in the marriage, the couple that are married, as well as any children that the couple may raise. Correct? Yes, sir. And you believe that legalizing gay and lesbian marriage would benefit gay and lesbian couples as well as any children they raise, correct? I believe that it would be likely to do so. Well, you believe it would be almost certain to do so, correct, sir? I, I do believe it's almost certainly true that gay and lesbian couples and their children would benefit by having gay marriage. Now, um, you, have, um, you have said that if adopting same-sex marriage, and I'm, I'm going to refer here to your book, The Future of Marriage, and you've got that at tab 13 of the binder, um, that I handed out, and I'm going to be looking at page 20. Um, you can read along with me uh, if you'd like. Tab 13 of the binder, page 20. Yes, sir. Um, and at the top of the page, you write, if adopting same-sex marriage was likely to be part of a larger societal shift, leading to better marriages, less divorce, and less unwed <coughs> childbearing, or more modestly, if it seemed likely that adopting same-sex marriage would not significantly undermine efforts to renew our wider marriage culture, I am confident that most marriage advocates would favor its adoption. I know I would. But if adopting same-sex marriage is likely to impede that larger goal, I will be against it. Um, and, and that's what you believe, correct, sir? Yes, sir. Um, and uh, in saying that if adopting same-sex marriage would impede that goal, you would be against it, uh, what you are saying is that you believe that the rights of gays and lesbians should take second place to the needs of an existing social institution, correct? Well, maybe you could point me to the sentence. Sure. Um, it's actually the very next sentence. Um, you say, those who disagree with me can charge that I am proposing a moral metric in which regardless of the ultimate policy decision on same-sex marriage, the rights of gays and lesbians take second place to the needs of an existing in social institution. Do you see that? Yes, sir. And you say that the charge would be accurate, correct? Yes, sir. Um, and is it fair? I was trying to say that from the point, I, the answer to your question is, is yes. I just only might point out that <clears throat> I did say that I was saying I understood and accepted the validity of the argument of those who disagreed with me. Yes. I appreciate that, sir. <clears throat> and, and is it fair to summarize, summarize to say that um, <clears throat> Your, your choice would be to choose marriage as a public good over the rights and needs of gay and lesbian adults 
and those same-sex couples who are raising children. Well, again, I'd like you to, I'm not trying to be difficult, but I'd just like to see the sentence you're referring to. Um, uh, sure. Um, uh, the very bottom of the page, the last uh, sentence, you write, to the degree that I must choose, with some anguish, I will choose children's collective rights and needs. I will choose marriage as a public good over the rights and needs of gay and lesbian adults and those same-sex couples who are raising children. You see that? Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Boys, the whole purpose of my book was to argue. Sure, I'm, I'm, I'm really not asking for the whole purpose of your book. Well, and, and, I, I would just like to say that the sentences you're, it's, a, it's an important point. The sentences that you're citing are an argument about what I call goods in conflict. I, I'm one of the, those persons who do not believe that this issue is a, a case of good versus bad. I believe and have gone to great lengths to say that I believe that there are valid arguments on both sides of the issue and my book is an <coughs> attempt to explore that. And these sentences you are selecting are examples of me exploring that what I'm calling goods in conflict. Yes, and, and um it just helps to know I, I what, what I'm trying to argue here. Exactly. And I, I thought you would be agreeable to what, the, what I'm pointing out to you. Uh, in I, fact, in I fact, am agreeable. I'm just providing a context so that people can understand, and you can understand, why these sentences are stated as they are. All right. Let's have a question and an answer. Um, uh, in fact, in your book, The Future of Marriage, you list approximately 20 uh, possible benefits of um, allowing gay and lesbian marriage, correct? Yes, sir. Those benefits that I listed in the book were a result of a uh, collaborative discussion that I led, and they involved advocates of both sides of the position. And we tried to uh, come up with, over time, we tried to come up with a uh, list of the uh, likely or possible benefits of gay marriage, the likely or possible uh, disadvantages. And so I enumerated those uh, in that chapter of my book. Okay. Now, um, if you turn to page 203 of your book, again behind tab 13, it is the um, page with the heading Goods in Conflict, and then the subheading, Positive Consequences? Yes, sir. Um, uh, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you just which of these you agree with, if any. Um, because as I understand it, this was sort of a group thought experiment that was going on. Yes, sir. And um, uh, you put down uh, on a, a whiteboard a lot of ideas that, that people had both for and against gay marriage, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And um, you did not necessarily agree with any particular idea. You just wrote it down if it was brought up by somebody, correct? Well, there was a process, but the substance of what you're saying is correct. Okay. So what I want to know, um, because you're the witness here, I want to know which, if any, of these positive consequences of gay and lesbian marriage you agree with? Yes, sir, and I only wish to say that with each of them, the issue that we discussed was likely, not definite, but likely. Likely? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, because these are all speculative in the sense that they're an attempt to predict something that will happen in the future. It's an important point, and so the issue is Blankenhorn, likely. Mr. Blankenhorn, you may have important points to make. But I think I do, actually. I, I know you do. I, I know you do. Uh, but uh, this is not a debate. I no, sir. I'm trying to under I'm trying have to you understand you the questions. nature of what I wrote in the book. I'm trying to ask you questions. Let, let, let's I'm doing my very best to answer your questions. All right. Let's, let's not interrupt one another. Your Honor, could I ask that the witness be instructed <laughs> to listen to the question, answer my question, and not make a statement that is not responsive to the <clears throat> question, even if he believes it's important. I don't need such instruction. That's what my intention is to do exactly that. Okay. And um, um, <clears throat> Mr. Blankenhorn, one of the instructions that uh, the court gives to the jury 
when an expert <coughs> witness testifies is to consider the witness's background, training, and experience, the testimony that the witness gives, the reasons that the witness gives for the opinions that he expresses, and all of the other evidence in the case. And all of that other evidence, of course, includes the demeanor of the witnesses. And the demeanor of the witnesses is sometimes gauged, importantly, by the responsiveness of the witness to the questions that he's asked. So with that in mind, because I'm sure you would not want your demeanor on the stand to be a negative factor in your testimony, uh, I would urge you to pay close attention to Mr. Boyce's questions and to answer them directly, succinctly, and then to the extent additional elaboration should be brought out, your very able counsel, I'm sure Mr. Mr. Cooper, uh, will be able to do that. So bear that in mind. Yes, sir, I will. All right, fine. Um, so, Mr. Blankenhorn, could you just go down this list of possible positive consequences and tell me which, if any, you personally agree with. And just uh, tell me by number, because these are all numbered, and I think it'll go faster if you simply tell me which of the numbers here, if any, you personally agree with. Do you want me to read each one silently to myself and then tell you one, yes, that's how, what you want me to do? Uh, what, what I would, if you read, it, read it silently to yourself. And then just tell me which of these you agree with. Give me the numbers of the items that you agree with. For each of the 23. Yes. <clears throat> Number one, yes. Number two, yes. Number three, yes. Number four, yes. Number five, yes. <clears throat> Number six, yes. Number seven, yes. Number eight, no. Number nine, no. Number 10, yes. Number 11, yes. Number 12. 
12, I don't know. Number 13, no. Number 14, no. Number 15, yes. Number 16, I don't know. Number 17, no. Number 18, yes. Number 19, yes. Number 20, I don't know. Number 21, I don't know. Number 22, yes. Number 23, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Now, I'd like to publish this list and go through it and both identify those that you agree with and then ask you some questions about some of the ones that you said you disagreed with. Publish this up on the board. Um, a little more readable by um, making some of the ones we deal with first um, larger. Um, the first point that you agreed with was that same-sex marriage would meet the stated needs and desires of lesbian and gay couples who want to marry. In so doing, it would improve the happiness and well-being of gay and lesbian individuals, couples, and family matter members. I said many, <clears throat> many gay and lesbian individuals, couples, and family members. Yes. I uh, misread that. Let me just read it to be clear. Same-sex marriage would meet the stated needs and desires of lesbian and gay couples who want to marry. In so doing, it would improve the happiness and well-being of many gay and lesbian individuals, couples, and family members. Uh, the second positive consequence that you agreed with was gay marriage would extend a wide range of the natural and practical benefits of marriage to many lesbian and gay couples and their children. The third positive consequence that you agreed with was extending the right to marry to same-sex couples would probably mean that a higher proportion of gays and lesbians would choose to enter into committed relationships. The fourth positive consequence that you agreed with 
was that same-sex marriage would likely contribute to more stability and to longer-lasting relationships for committed same-sex couples. The fifth positive consequence that you agreed with was that same-sex marriage might lead to less sexual promiscuity among lesbians and, open parentheses, perhaps especially, close parentheses, gay men. The sixth positive consequence that you agreed with was that same-sex marriage would signify greater social acceptance of homosexual love and the worth and validity of same-sex intimate relationships. The seventh positive consequence, which you agreed with, was that gay marriage would be a victory for the worthy ideas of tolerance and inclusion. It would likely decrease the number of those in society who tend to be viewed warily as, quote, other, close quote, and increase the number who are accepted as part of, quote, us, close quote. In that respect, gay marriage would be a victory for and another key expansion of the American idea. Uh, and I have read those correctly, have I not, sir? Yes, sir. Um, then uh, items um, 8 and 9 um, you disagreed with, correct? Yes, sir. And then item 10 you agreed to, and that reads, gay marriage might contribute over time to a decline in anti-gay prejudice as well as, more specifically, a reduction in anti-gay hate crimes. And the 11th po positive consequence, and again one that you agreed with, was that posi uh, the number 11 reads, because marriage is a wealth-creating institution, extending marriage rights to same-sex couples would probably increase wealth accumulation and lead to higher standards for the higher for living the, standards higher living standards for these couples as well as help reduce welfare costs open parentheses by promoting family economic self-sufficiency close parentheses and decrease economic inequality and did I read those correctly with your help yes sir um, uh, number 12, you said you didn't know. Numbers 13 and 14, you disagreed with, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, number 15, which you agreed with, reads, extending marriage rights to same-sex couples would probably reduce the proportion of homosexuals who marry persons of the opposite sex and thus would, re would likely reduce instances of marital unhappiness and divorce. And did I read that correctly? Yes, sir. Then number 16, which you said you didn't know, and number 17, which you disagreed with, correct? Yes, sir. And then number 18, which you agreed with, reads, by increasing the number of married couples who might be interested in adoption and foster care, same-sex marriage might well lead to fewer children growing up in state institutions and more growing up in loving, adoptive, and foster families. And number 19, which you also agreed with, reads, adopting same-sex marriage would likely be accompanied by a wide-ranging and potentially valuable national discussion of marriage's benefits, status, and future. And did I read those items correctly? Yes, sir. And am I correct that items 20 and 21, you don't know whether you agree with or not? Yes, sir. And then number 22 is one that you do agree with, <clears throat> which is that gay marriage would probably expand the possibility and likelihood of new scholarly research on a variety of topics related to marriage and parenting, correct? I'm absolutely certain of that one. <laughs> yeah. And then number 23, you don't know, correct? Correct. Now, I'd like to ask you to go back to number 14, which um, you said you disagreed with. And um, I want to ask you about certain p parts of that. 
and see whether there's any part of that that you agree with. Um, uh, there's a reference here to, quote, marriage light, close quote, schemes, such as civil unions and domestic partnerships. Do you see that? Yes, sir. And there is a statement here that those marriage light schemes can harmfully blur the distinctions between marriage and non-marriage. You see that? Yes, sir. You believe that that part of this statement is true? The part that you have read so far? Yes, just the, just this this just this part. No, sir, I, I do not believe that I I do not believe that it's true. Okay. Okay. Um, no, let me ask saying you, again that this is a what's likely. Yes, I know I understand. And, and that's what I'm saying. Um, uh, my, my question was whether you believed it was likely that marriage light schemes, what you refer to here is, or what the, is written here as marriage light schemes, such as civil unions and domestic partnerships, whether it's likely that those can harmfully blur the distinctions between marriage and non-marriage. Well, now you've just read one part of it, because I do uh, believe that it, 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 is a, it is a concern of mine that uh, it is one concern that needs to be taken into account that uh, uh, domestic partnership and, and civil unions, uh, because they are in some respects comparable to marriage, it, it is a concern that they could uh, blur <coughs> this distinction. It, it, it is a concern. I, I was basing my thought on the fact that you had read me a, a much longer portion of it. Um, let me uh, see if I understand what you're saying. Um, you are saying that marriage light schemes, such as civil unions and domestic partnerships, are a concern to you because those schemes might well or could uh, harmfully blur the distinctions between marriage and non-marriage. Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, now, I'd like to um, ask you to turn uh, to the document that is in the pocket of the, the beginning pocket of your binder, right at the very beginning. It is uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2332A. I'm sorry, I'm... I, I'm having a hard time. Yes, you may. This is a copy of the index of materials, the <coughs> list of materials that in your expert report you said that you had considered and relied on. Do you recognize it as such? It's titled, Index of Materials Considered. And did you understand that as part of your expert report, um, you were supposed to list the materials that you considered and relied on in preparing your expert report? Did you understand that? No, sir. I, I, okay. As I explained yesterday, and we had a back and forth you, you about this. You don't have to explain it. If you didn't understand it, I just thought you asked me the question. I understand. Um, uh, Perhaps if you showed the witness the expert report, it yes. might be of some help. The expert report is in the is in the binder that you have. You told us. PX743, I believe. And you see 
marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 2332A is a copy of what you attach to your expert report. Yes, sir. That's, yes, sir. Now, um, I would like you um, to go down this list. This is a list of materials. And I would like you to tell me which of these materials, it is your testimony, assert that permitting gay marriage will adversely affect heterosexual marriage. I'll be happy to do my best. I, I don't think I can give you a precise answer because I don't have the ability now to, you know, reread each of these documents. But I'll do my best to give you a judgment if that's what you want me to do. Yes, it, it's it's your it's your best testimony, um, and obviously people can later go look it up. Uh, um, could you say again what it is you are asking me if these materials contain? Whether the materials uh, contain a statement that, or an assertion, that permitting gay and lesbian marriage will adversely affect heterosexual marriage. Again, perhaps the easiest way is for you simply to tell me the numbers uh, that relate to materials that you believe uh, fit what I'm asking. Well, with the uh, provisos that I can't speak with absolute confidence about this, and with the proviso that the overwhelming majority of these materials were, were actually written before the gay marriage debate even came up on the national stage and were cited not about the subject you're asking me about, I will answer your question by saying uh, 2, 3, 10, 13, 24, 27, 27, and that's all. All right. Uh, let me go through, um, through, e through each of those. Uh, let me begin <coughs> with um, certain... Uh, declarations that you have identified. 
Um, number 10 is a declaration of Alan C. Carlson, correct? Yes. And who is Alan C. Carlson? Uh, well, he's a writer and researcher, and um, he's written some books on marriage, and he, uh, uh, I don't know, they're used to, I think the group he heads is a, a private uh, conservative think tank in uh, in Illinois, uh, I think it's called the Howard Center. His doctorate is in um, is in history. So he's not an anthropologist or a psychologist or a sociologist. Is that correct? No, sir. He's a historian. Um, and then the other declaration that you identified was the declaration of Maggie Gallagher. Uh, correct? Number 24? Well, that was one of them. Yes, sir. Um, and who is Maggie Gallagher? She is uh, one of the leading uh, opponents of gay marriage in the public debate today. She's a writer and I guess you might say uh, organizer, writer and organizer, whose principal focus has been marriage and whose principal focus in the past four, four or five years has been to uh, lead a, a campaign and to make public arguments uh, in opposition to gay marriage. Uh, do you consider her a scholar? I consider as, as, you, as you have used those words. I do, yes. As I as I am using the term, I believe that she is a serious, intellect an intellectually serious person. Yes. And 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 an intellectually serious person is what you have meant when you have referred to scholars in your testimony. No, if you want me, to, if you want to quarrel over the terms, I, I'm not quarreling. I'm just asking what you meant. So, what's your question? Um, you have used a number of times in your testimony, both your direct testimony and occasionally your cross, the term scholar to refer to people that you have relied on. Do you recall that? Yes, I, I do not, uh, I did not mean, I, I miss, if you think I mean that I believe that the definition of scholar is someone who is intellectually serious, then I misspoke. So um, we can. And, and when you use the term scholar, what are you referring to? Well, let's see. <clears throat> I hadn't thought recently to try to form a kind of a dictionary definition, but my, uh, I guess my understanding of a scholar would be someone who is um, able and equipped to engage uh, seriously with intellectual uh, competence with one or more uh, bodies of evidence and to make um, rigorous uh, uh, analyses and arguments about uh, one or more uh, bodies of evidence. And I uh, believe that the ideals of, of good scholarship are to um, be, uh, to, 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 have, uh, to have integrity, that is to try to seek the truth of the matter. And do you believe that one of the attributes of good scholarship is objectivity? Um, objectivity in the sense of uh, trying to uh, see uh, things whole and trying to uh, understand uh, and engage seriously with opposing points of view and treat those opposing points of view uh, respectfully uh, in that sense yes there is an ideal in scholarship that that would be that you might call those cluster of terms or that those aspirations you might call those objectivity yes see Maggie Gallagher uh, has a dual role she's is a journalist and writer but she's also an activist and a partisan in this in this in this uh, public debate I've tried to make that clear um, uh, has she published any peer review articles 
Yes. Um, uh, which ones? Well, I don't have her CV in front of me right now, Mr. Boyce. I mean, I, I happen to know that she's published uh, several articles in peer-reviewed law journals, but I, I don't, uh, I, I'm not able to recall the specifics of her 20-year publication history right now. Uh, can you recall any peer-reviewed article by Maggie Gallagher? Yes, sir. That you have relied on? That I have relied on. Yes. Well, uh, I've read a number of them over the years. I mean, if that's what you mean, I've read them, and they have helped along with thousands of other articles and books to shape my overall views on things. Um, what was the most recent peer-reviewed article by Maggie Gallagher that you have relied on, that you think is reliable, as objective uh, scholarship with integrity. Uh, you're putting words in my mouth. Well, l let me um, let me not put words in your mouth. Let me simply ask a question. Um, uh, has Maggie Gallagher written any peer-reviewed article that you believe is characterized by the ideals of integrity and ob objectivity that you have described? that you have relied on? That I have relied on for my testimony here today? Uh, let's, let's answer that question first. I have, I, that wasn't really my question, but, but let's, let's put that question and get an answer to that. There are n no such articles that I have specifically relied on for my testimony here today, or okay. my preparation for my testimony here today. OK. Um, uh, another one of the items that you identified, and by my count you identified a total of six items. Um, another one of the items that you identified was um, Norval Glenn, the struggle for same-sex marriage, and that was one of the articles that Mr. Cooper based with you. Am I correct? Yes, sir. <clears throat> and would you turn to that in Mr. Cooper's book? I Can believe, someone tell me the tab? I believe that it is um, tab 18. <clears throat> Um, now, uh, you said that Mr. Glenn um, asserted that permitting gay and lesbian marriage would adversely affect heterosexual marriage, correct? Well. I believe I was answering a question of yours, and I believe the way you asked me was to, based on uh, reviewing this list called Index of Materials Considered, if I could identify for you any documents in that list that I thought the view of the author was that adopting same-sex marriage would weaken the institution of marriage. Okay. Um. Uh, I'm glad that we clarified that. Um, now I want to go back to the list. And the, the six items that you have identified are items which you say, I want to get your word. thought this was materials where the view of the author was that adopting same-sex marriage would weaken the institution of marriage. That's what, you were That's what I just said. Yes, sir. Now, I want to ask 
a somewhat different question um, with respect to these items that you've identified. And that is, which of these six did this material that's here, that's listed here, contain an assertion that permitting gay and lesbian marriage would harm heterosexual marriage. Do you understand the difference between the two? If not, I'll explain. I'm afraid I don't. Okay. Um, you were doing two things. One, you were giving me what you thought the author believed. Yes, sir. And I'm asking you not what the author believes, in your view, but what the author said. Second, said I, not in some book or article that exists in the world, but says specifically in the words that you have stipulated in this narrow list of material cited. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and that's it's a very point. narrow question, but I'm happy to try to do my best to answer yes. it. Yes. And so what I'm asking you is, which, if any, of these materials themselves, not some other material. Written material, these book, peer-reviewed articles, so forth. Only these materials. Only these materials that you've listed. Which of these materials contain assertions that permitting gay and lesbian marriage will harm heterosexual marriage or the institution of heterosexual marriage? If any. Does it have to say it in that exact form of words that you have offered? Um, uh, no, in words or in substance, uh, so that a reasonable reader could read it and say, this writer in this publication is asserting that gay and lesbian marriage will weaken heterosexual marriage. Be likely to weaken heterosexual marriage. The issue is always likely, Mr. Boyes. It's not, there's no such thing as certainty about predicting a future event. The concept here is always what is likely in their judgment to occur. I, I, I accept that, um, uh, Mr. Blankenhorn. Blankenhorn. Well, I don't uh, really, with the proviso that I, I can't speak with confidence about this unless I were to reread each of these documents word for word right now. But my, to the, my best effort to answer your question right now would be that the list I have given you would be the same list. So that each of the six that you've identified, you believe these materials themselves assert in words or in substance that um, permitting gay and lesbian marriage will harm heterosexual marriage. I believe that, that a reason, as you put it, a reasonable reader reading these materials would conclude that this author has stated or suggested that adopting gay marriage would be likely to weaken marriage as a social institution. Now, in that answer, you said stated or suggested. Um, do you uh, use those terms interchangeably, synonymously, or do you mean something different by them? I mean something different by them. What do you mean? Would it be okay if I gave you an example, or would you rather me state it abstractly? I'd rather you state it in concept. Stated would be an unequivocal assertion that is similar to the wording that you have uh, offered in your, you know, is a, a, be an unmistakable, no possible way to doubt the declared intent of the sentence or the paragraph. A suggestion would be an would be a way of making an argument, stating it so that a reasonable reader would understand clearly based on the written words that the author has a serious concern or a serious worry or is stating his or her belief that it would be likely 
that adopting gay marriage would weaken marriage as a social institution. Now, uh, with respect to the six items that you've identified, uh, let me ask the question separately. Um, I was afraid that might be where we were going. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting predictable. <laughs> uh, uh, which of these, um, uh, in your testimony, does the author in this material state, using state the way you have described it, that permitting gay and lesbian marriage would uh, harm a heterosexual marriage? Well, I think you would probably have to take Cherlin off the list, number 13, because while he argues that gay marriage is contributing to the deinstitutionalization of gay marriage, that's, the, that's his statement, he does not specifically, in words that you're calling for him to do, make the statement that you are calling for him to make. So I think we would have to probably take him off that, that very narrow list. So let's keep going. Uh, well, you might have to take Norval Glenn, number 27, off the list, but although because he does say that adopting gay marriage would be likely to result in the deinstitutionalization of marriage, he does not have the form of words that are in the unequivocal statement that you're asking for. So let's take him off the list. <laughs> On number three, Agasinski, I've read a lot of her work, and I know that she is an opponent of same-sex marriage, and I know in great detail the reasons why she is an opponent, and I know that she believes that it would be a result of the deinstitutionalization of marriage, and it's been an important body of work for me, her work as a philosopher and as a scholar, but I cannot speak with certainty about the exact form of words in this one book listed here called Parity of the Sexes. So let's take her off the list as well. And you, you do understand that it's not the exact form of words. It is the unmistakable. It's an extremely narrow and rigid category that you're erecting here, and which is your perfect right to do. So let's take her off the list. I just want to be sure that we're taking her off the list because you can't say that... An opponent of same-sex marriage, but uh, let's take her off the list. I want to be clear that the reason we're taking her off the list is because you cannot say that in this particular material that's cited here um, that she unmistakably communicates that permitting gay and lesbian marriage would harm heterosexual marriage? My answer is that I know with absolute certainty that she opposes gay marriage for the reason that it would contribute to the deinstitutionalization of marriage. My concluding part of my answer is that I do not know with absolute certainty that those sentences appear in the text called parity of the sexes. And so for that reason, I think we should remove her from the list. And you do understand, sir, that all I am doing is asking you about the materials you listed. You understand that, don't you? Of course I do. Okay. Um, uh, now, is there anything, any, uh, anybody else you take off the list? I don't think so. Okay. Um, uh, now, uh, let me follow up something that you said about Norval Glenn, just because we've got his um, article in front of us, and that's Defendant's Exhibit um, 60. Um, you said he did state that permitting gay and lesbian marriage was likely to result in the deinstitutionalization of marriage. Do I understand you correctly? Well, if where you're going with this is to ask me to show you in his article the word deinstitutionalization, to the best of my knowledge, the word 
I don't know whether the word is there or not. I don't think it is. But my testimony to you is that in substance, that is what he is saying. Um, let me ask you to look at some of what he actually said and see whether you define it as being in substance what you say. Um, um, and, and first, let me just ask you a general point. Um, as you understand what Mr. Glenn is doing in, in this article, is he trying to decide or trying to assert whether gay marriage is or is not a good idea? Or is he trying to talk about his concerns about the debate about same-sex marriage? My memory of the article is that it's the latter. Okay. So what, 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 he is, what he's really concerned about here is he's concerned that the debate about same-sex marriage is harming or could, could potentially harm the institution of marriage. Is that correct? As, I, as you have said and as I have agreed, the, my, I have not read this article in several years. The reason it's cited in the list of materials considered is because I excerpted a specific paragraph from it in my report. But my memory of the article is, as you have stated, is that it is more a discussion. This is in keeping with a lot of his scholarship. This is in more of a discussion of an analysis of the debate rather than an advocacy or a polemical argument in favor of one side or the other. Um, but I, well. And, and, and for example, one of the things he believes is that legalizing same-sex marriage would have a small effect at most on the percentage of fatherless children. Correct, sir? I don't recall where he says that. Could you point that paragraph out? Uh, sure. Um, if you uh, turn to page 28. Um, and the second column like the seventh line down, you see where he says legitimate, legitim, uh, legitimate. I see where you are. I'd just like to read the sentence. That, that's me. making it legal. Uh, uh, making legal same-sex marriage would have a small effect at most on the percentage of fatherless children. You see that? I'm, I'm just reading the, the... I understand, but do you see what I've just read? I do, I do see it. Yes, sir. Now, um, uh, take... Take as much time as you want to review the context, and when you have finished, let me know. now understand that in this paragraph... Sir, he... sir uh, I, I'm not asking you when, when I say, please let me know. I'm not saying, please let me know what you think the context is. I'm just saying, please let me know when you've finished reviewing the context, because I have some questions. I finished. Now, do you agree that legalizing same-sex marriage would have a small effect at most on the percentage of fatherless children? Do you agree with that? No, sir, I do not. No, prior to the time that I showed you this, that that was an assertion that Professor Glenn made. Of course I did, because I've read the article. Okay. Um, but wouldn't it help to know what he's trying to say here? Um, what I'm trying to do is focus on the words that... So am I. 
His words. Not your interpretation or not what you think is important. Well, could we just read the paragraph? Um, uh, you'll have an opportunity to read the whole paragraph. So we don't want to know what he's actually saying. Okay. Um, well, one of the things he says immediately after that, um, uh, to complete the sentence, um, the entire sentence says, legitimating of same-sex marriage would have a small effect at most on the percentage of fatherless children and there is no precedent for prohibiting a family arrangement because it creates less than ideal conditions for children. Well, that's not the point I was trying to make. I won't point. make it. It's okay. That's, that, that's the complete sentence, correct? That is the complete sentence. Yes, sir. That is the complete sentence. Okay. Now, um, do you agree that there is no precedent for prohibiting a family arrangement because it creates less than ideal conditions for children? By prohibiting, do you mean making it illegal? Do, do I believe that there is a family form that has been made illegal because it is less than ideal for children? Um, when Professor Glenn writes, legalizing same-sex marriage would have a small effect at most on the percentage of fatherless children, and there is no precedent for prohibiting a family arrangement because it creates less than ideal conditions for children. Um, do you agree that with what he says here, that there is no precedent for prohibiting a family arrangement because it creates less than ideal conditions for children? Well, when I think of our prohibition of the family form of polygamy, I believe that one of the important reasons why we have historically, if you go back in the records, I believe that I'm not an expert in this area. This is not something I've studied in detail. I don't know how relevant it is to our conversation. But it is a certainly a family form that is in the present in the world, in societies, and it is prohibited. Uh, here in the United States, and I believe, uh, based on my imperfect uh, study, that one of the reasons that it is prohibited is, is that it is considered less than ideal for children, and I believe the historical record of the discussion of that, I'm fairly confident, would uh, confirm that. I, I think there probably are probably other examples of family forms as well, but I would have to give that some thought. Um, speaking of polygamy, uh, since you raised it, um, uh, and I understand that you say you're not an expert on it, um, but um, uh, are you aware of uh, what reasons were stated for prohibiting polygamy in the United States? Well, I believe I just, in, in answer to your previous question, I just stated that it is not a, a, a field of, of expertise of mine. Are you aware of any of the reasons that were stated for prohibiting polygamy in the United States? in the sense of, of having studied it and believing myself to be competent to speak with expert knowledge on that subject, the answer is no. Okay. Um, in, incidentally, um, uh, you've testified about your three rules uh, of the game for marriage. I don't think I used those terms uh, today or yesterday. Um, well, you've certainly um, said that that was the basis of um, a lot of your views. Have you not, sir? Well, I think I would rather tell you, in my words, what my views are than have you put, try to put them in my mouth. Well, sir, um, uh, uh, we're going to actually go to your words in your deposition, but... Um, uh, uh, have you described um, the rules of the game for marriage? My understanding is that the phrase rules of the game, uh, I think I might have used it in my book and my report, and I, I, I'm not trying to make a quarrel over this, but I, I think it was actually quoting, I think I put it in quotes, and I think it was from Professor North. I think I was citing an article from uh, Professor North. I'm not confident of that, but I think it's true. 
I mean, if it's important to you to pin down this wording, I'd be happy to take a moment and try to try to make sure, try to give you complete clarity on that question. Well, I, I would like I would like to get. Um, uh, See, I think the the, the economist. Testimony. Okay. Um, and that is, um, I, mean, I mean, first. Um, and you make it sound like a kind of a jocular thing, and I think I, I was quoting I, this. I wasn't meaning to, I wasn't mean to say jocular, sir. I, I really wasn't. I was just trying to use the... Um, um, I'm going for clarity uh, here. Um, right. Um, you have said that the main rules of the game when it comes to marriage are three, correct? Let's try to find, I just want to pin this down. If you give me a moment, I'd like to see if, if I'm right about how I use the term. Question pending, <clears throat> Mr. Blankenhorn. I'm trying to answer the question about did I use the term rules of the game. That's the question I'm, I'm seeking, and I, I will stop my inquiry if you wish me to. Do you wish me to? I wish you to answer the question. The You've question asked me if I use this term, rules of the game, and I'm trying to answer it, and I'll stop my inquiry if you wish me to. Sir, question you have said that the main rules of the game when it comes to marriage are three. Yes, I was correct. The 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 the, the sure, phrase sure, "rules sure, of the sure. game" comes Question. from a Nobel Prize-winning economist who who is t wrote a paper that actually won him a Nobel Prize about the role of institutions uh, in society. That's the t that's where that phrase comes from, and that's why I put it in quotes, and that's why it's footnoted. Sir, um, let me ask you the question. I'm not asking you where it came from. I will. Um, I'm not asking you whether you put it in quotes or not. What I'm asking you is whether it is you your view, whether it is your view that the main rules of the game when it comes to marriage are three. Is that your view, regardless of how you've come to it? I believe that marriage has three fundamental foundational structures, and there has been times in my writings that I have referred to them as rules. And when you refer to your writings where you have referred to them as rules, would you include the report that you submitted in this litigation? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and you have said that your source of these three rules are principally the body of scholarship on the anthropology of human marriage, correct? It's what I believe. I don't, it, I'll, I'll just, would it be okay to say that is what I believe? You said I've stated it. I, I, I don't recall being asked that question by you so far, but it is what I believe. Okay. Um, and the scholars um, that you rely on for your belief are who? Would, would you like a, a comprehensive list? Um, I would like the most important scholars that you rely on, or the scholars that you rely on the most. Okay, well, if you'll give me a moment to compose my thoughts on that, I'll give you a, a, a 
brief list of principal scholars. I'm going to take a moment to just make a note to myself here as I try to collect my thoughts on that question. Would it be against the uh, Would it be against procedure for me to consult a copy of my book to see the index? Um, let, let me let, let me ask you to do it this way. Um, uh, putting on the record that you haven't consulted your book or your index, and putting on the record that you don't have a photographic memory and you don't remember everything that's in there. I think there would be probably fifty or sixty names on the list. I'm asking you is as you sit here now as a testifying expert, what are the scholars that you think most important in your mind? Okay. Well, that's a different question. Uh, I would say that the, the... The most important scholars, just to be clear, that you rely on for your understand. Uh, three rules. I hear you. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the scholars that have influenced me uh, most deeply on this have been uh, Bronislaw Malinowski and Meyer Fortas. Okay. Um, now, the three rules, why don't you state what the three rules are? Well, may I just say, I will, but may I say, you call them rules and you've quoted this Nobel Prize winning economist no, about no, no, rules no. of the no, game. I did, not quote, not, I did not quote the Nobel Prize winning economist. That's sir. where the phrase rules of the game that you attributed to me came from. You said you have referred to rules of the game and I'm trying to point out that that phrase comes from a Nobel Prize winning economist sir, who's studying the role of institutions. Sir, I asked you whether it was your view your view that the main rules of the game when it came to marriage were three. Do you recall me asking you that question? At a pretty extended colloquy, so I certainly recall the question. Okay. And now, and, 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 you, an and you answered that that was your view. And I specifically said, I'm not asking about what any economist is saying, whether you won, won the Nobel Prize or not. I'm not asking what anybody else is saying. I'm just asking for your views. And, it, and your views is that when it comes to marriage, there are three main rules of the game. And let me say, I'm not suggesting that that's, you said before, that rules of the game was taking it too lightly or something like that. I don't yes, mean, sir, that was exactly my suggestion. I don't mean it in that sense, okay? Rules of the game can be a, a serious um, principle, okay? I will accept that. I don't want to... I don't want you to get... Well, then I will not belabor it one more moment. Okay. 
Okay. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and we could even use a different phraseology if that makes you more comfortable. A absolutely understood. We can proceed. That's absolutely the only point I was trying to make. Okay. And, and I accept that point. Okay. Um, now, um, what are the three main rules um, that you believe uh, define marriage? Well, the first uh, is what you might call the rule of opposites. That was the man, the, the, what is the customary man-woman basis of marriage. And Second? Two. That is, marriage is uh, two people. Okay. And the third? It's a sexual relationship. Okay. Now, let me ask you about those three rules that you use to define marriage. Um, uh, first, with respect to the rule of opposites. By the way, I, I want to just clarify. I'm not saying that those three rules constitute a definition of marriage. What I'm referring to, that was the term you just used in your question or your statement. What I'm saying is that those are the three essential foundations of the marital institutions or the three essential structures of the marital institution. And that's where we, we, you know, we get into this concept of rules. Or, 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 so that's, that's what I'm trying to say. Okay. The three essential structures of the institution of marriage. Is that an acceptable terminology? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, the first of these three essential structures of the institution of marriage is the rule of opposites. Correct? Yes, sir. Um, now, are you aware of marriages in other societies that have not been limited to people of the opposite sex? Well, I'm certainly aware that uh, assertions have been made in the popular and occasionally in the scholarly literature that s such cases exist, and I have not <clears throat> in depth studied every single example of such an assertion, but I have troubled myself to try to familiarize myself to the best of my ability with quite a number of such assertions. And I have uh, views about them, uh, both collectively and individually, and I will share them with you uh, if, if you wish. Uh, let me just begin first by asking you whether, in your view, there are any examples in history of marriages that do not comply with your first essential structure of the institution of marriage, that is the rule of opposites. Well, of course, we would have to recognize that in Massachusetts now there are such marriages. Massachusetts and in Iowa and Spain and uh, Sweden and the Netherlands and I'm aware. Canada. I'm aware. I'm just trying to be clear. So I'm not. I'm sure. I understand that in the localities that have in recent months and years adopted same-sex marriage, and that's the controversy and the set of disagreements that bring us here today. I'm perfectly aware of the context. Um, let me. Um, uh, ask you a uh, pointed question. Are you aware of any uh, instances of marriage in any society prior to the last 50 years that was inconsistent with your first essential structure of the institution of marriage, that is, the rule of opposites? There are two or three or four uh, uh, what I would call hard cases 
in in the literature, um, and as I said, we we could discuss them if you wish. I would say that as a, a if you'll allow me to make the proviso that I'm aware that there are probably two or three uh, hard cases that require very specific understandings of the context. I will say that generally speaking of marriage as a global phenomenon, I would say that there are either no or almost no exceptions to this principle that marriage is between a man and a woman. So my answer, just to be very precise, is that I know that the scholars have some uh, debates about two or three small instances in, in, in the field of anthropology. So my answer to you to be on the safe side, for me, for me to be on the safe side, is to say that there are no or almost no exceptions to this structural feature of marriage. Now you say in that answer no or almost no, and as you I'm probably, trying to account for the two or three hard cases. And as you probably expect, that's what I'm going to ask you about. I thought you might. <laughs> um, now, um, my question is uh, not whether there is a debate, but whether you as an expert have an opinion as to whether or not in societies prior to the last 50 years there have been marriages that are inconsistent with your rule of opposites. May I say that that form of the question is quite a different question because the issue here is that the scholars have concerned themselves with is are there examples of marriage in societies that are some ways resemble or, or, or precursors or, or, or uh, prefigure the concept of same-sex marriage. That's a very different question. Those are two very different questions and so I wish you would clarify which of them you wish me to answer. The question I want you to answer is whether in your view there are any instances in society prior to the last 50 years of marriages that are inconsistent with your rule of opposites. Okay, so it's the former. I will not seek to answer the question, uh, is there any marriages that could be considered same-sex marriages? It, it, it's it's not it's actually not a laughing matter to me, Mr. Boys, because I'll tell you, this is a very important topic, and uh, it's it you're it, it's, two, it's two different questions, and you can take your pick. I'll answer either one. Mr. Blankenhorn, Mr. Boys is not laughing at you. He's amused at the back and forth, as I think many of us who were observing this are. Try again, Mr. Boys. <laughs> I had tried to take my pick, Mr. Blankenhorn. Uh, that's what I was trying to do when I asked you the question. Okay, let's go. My question is whether, in your view, in societies prior to the last 50 years, there are marriages that have been inconsistent with your rule of opposites. Okay, if you'll just give me maybe 10 seconds to compose my thoughts on this. My answer is that I can think of one uh, instance of in a uh, human group 
that has been studied where some scholars believe and others disagree, but it is a hard case and there are arguments on both sides, but there has been one case where there is some dispute or some scholarly uh, argumentation over whether or not there is an exception to to this rule. So I, I, I think there's been uh, one that I think, I'm not saying that no other person has asserted something about some other phenomenon, but there's one that I think is a particularly significant one to me personally and I have, uh, so I would say my view is that I know of one instance in a, in a society <coughs> in which there m may have been, there are, there, according to some scholars, there may have been an exception to this rule. And, and what is that one instance? <coughs> There's a, um, a society uh, in Africa that it no longer happens this way, but there was a period of time where uh, the men of the of the group lived in mostly in military barracks. They were a warrior group, and they <clears throat> had an institution whereby adult men would ha have a uh, sexual relationship with a, a young boy, and this was uh, this uh, the, the, the anthropologists would sometimes translate. The word you they would sometimes translate the word as marrying. He, the man would <clears throat> give gifts to the boy's uh, parents, and that they would they had a sexual uh, relationship, and the boy was to address the man with a great term of respect and to serve him his meals and to be a kind of a servant for him as well as a sexual partner. And then when the <clears throat> uh, boy would. Uh, uh, outgrow that that initiatory uh, period. That initiatory uh, was no longer a part of that homosexual uh, relationship. He would often go on to marry uh, to to marry a woman with a, a conventional marriage ceremony. But there was a part of, of this experience that was a ritualized. It was surrounded by custom. It was recognized in law. And there was a period of time in a in a in a in a, in a highly uh, kind of a warrior society. Uh, the males were, uh, as I say, they lived in kind of uh, a kind of military barracks, and they <clears throat> would have a marriage-like relationship with a with a, uh, a a a male child, and this was uh, not viewed as a a deviant are are wrong are shameful in any way and uh, it was an accepted part uh, the, the kinship groups uh, accepted this and, and thought it was just a normal part of life and so uh, this in the <clears throat> uh, 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 Evans Richard the anthropologist who wrote of this uh, I he in translation, of course, he called it man-boy marriage, and so he used the term marriage in his scholarship, and he said, I use it advisedly, he said. I use it advisedly. This really, there was, this was a ceremonial thing, and so forth. And so, um, in Gilbert Hurt, a very prominent anthropologist, has written a book called uh, Ritualized Homosexuality uh, in Human Societies, and he talks of this, and there are perhaps some other examples where the where you have initiation uh, periods of time in the, in the life of young boys where they have a homosexual relationship with an, with an adult man and it, it's a phase of life. But sometimes this, is, this ha has a marriage-like feeling to it in terms of language, custom, and law. It tends to be uh, tr a transitory period of life and usually the man goes on then at a later point to marry a woman, but this is an example the, the principal example that I think <clears throat> constitutes a hard case if we are looking for, if we scour all of human history and all of, across all time, we could, if we find, if we're searching out for an exception, I think that's probably the most robust ethnographic uh, evidence 
would be uh, this one. Uh, and you said uh, this occurred in Africa? Yes, sir. Um, are you aware of that occurring in other cultures? Just to pick one by random, ancient Greece. That, that was not marriage. That was a different thing. The, 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 what I'm talking about here um, is something that scholars actually have, uh, they, they, they sometimes have, uh, it's in a subject of debate, but they sometimes think of this as a, a marriage-like relationship. There are other, uh, there are, to answer your question, um, uh, uh, the uh, prominent anthropologist Raymond Kelly has examined a, a, a society, a very small society that lives in Papua New Guinea and they <clears throat> have a, a similar arrangement whereby the uh, boys of the, uh, of the group uh, for a period of time during their boyhood have a sexual relations and uh, with the uh, with males and they believe that uh, they believe this these people these people believe that sexual uh, activity with a, a boy having sexual activity with a man contributes to his vitality his virility his manliness and they considered a, a, an important part of the development of his potential as a member of the tribe and this is a an example that Raymond Kelly these people are these uh, this tribe is the Itoro people and he has written a masterful uh, book called Itoro Social Structure that examines this in considerable detail although Kelly makes it clear that this is not marriage. He, he does not say that this is a marriage relationship. He understands it as part of Itoro social structure that, uh, that has a, uh, some kind of a mimicking quality for a period of time, but he views it as an in, essentially an initiation rite for the boys of the tribe that is of somewhat short duration, usually two or three years. And it, He's, he's, I think, actually the finest scholar that is working in this field. Um, now, uh, what I want to focus on is, is marriage. Um, and in, as you say, scouring all of human history to find examples, um, did you happen to come across uh, Professor Young, who was an expert for the defense in this case? Are you asking me if I know her? Y yes. I do know her. Um, and uh, did you read her uh, testimony in this case? No, sir, I did not. Um, have you ever talked to her about um, examples of marriage in prior societies that were inconsistent with your rule of opposites? No, sir. <laughs> Um, you do believe that she is a uh, expert in the field, do you not? The, the truth is that I know her uh, personally, but I have, I'm not familiar with her writings, and I would accept her expert status based on her, the very things that you pointed out that I didn't have yesterday. She is affiliated with the university. She teaches courses and so forth. So that's really all I, I know about her status as an expert. Um, now, let me go on to your second rule, your second essential structure of the institution of marriage, which was the rule of two people. Yes, sir. Um, now, uh, you are obviously aware of a lot of examples of marriages that are inconsistent with that rule, correct? No, sir. No. Um, what percentage of marriages uh, over the last 300 years have been limited to two people? In your judgment. The way that um, I 
and many other scholars have looked at this, the answer would be that almost every single marriage uh, is has been limited to two people. If I may just cut to the chase, I believe that perhaps I'm sorry, I, I thought you wanted me to pause for a moment. What? Okay. Uh, uh, if you wish, Mr. Boys, I can just cut to the chase, and it, perhaps you are talking about the uh, 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 polygamy and polyandry. Is that, was that, would, do you wish me to speak to the question of whether that violates the rule of two? Um, well, first of all, you recognize that uh, over the last 300 years, there have been more polygamous marriages than there have been um, marriages that have been limited to two people. Would you agree with that? I don't know, but my strong suspicion would be that that is erroneous, but I, I do not know. No, um, how, many, um, how many societies... In fact, I would be extremely surprised if that were a true statement. Um, uh, if I may, what, well, let me ask you some questions about that. Um, what societies are you aware of that, prior to the last hundred years, um, uh, had polygamy as a, a regular course? Best scholarly estimate I've seen on that is eighty-three percent. Eighty-three percent of the countries. 83% of societies. 83% of societies had polygamy as a regular course. No, sir. Uh, my question is... I'm, I'm trying to be precise here. Okay. Um, my question is, prior to the last hundred years... Let's, if you wish, we could just say in, in human history, because the scholarship I'm citing that says 83%. He's just trying to... 83% just... of what? What's the numerator? What's the societies. denominator? Societies. 83% of societies permit polygamy. Okay. 83% of societies permit polygamy. Um, That's a very different issue than how many marriages are polygamous. Yes. No, I, under, I do understand that. Because in a society that permits polygamy, you may still have marriages that only involve two people, correct? You may still have the overwhelming majority of marriages. And in fact, that is the case that well, only involve I, that, two people. That's what I'm asking you, okay? Um, uh, and let's, let's take the most populous places. Um, uh, India and China. Um, uh, is it your judgment that the majority of marriages in those two places uh, prior to the last hundred years um, have been limited to just two people as opposed to polygamous marriages? Well, you understand the question. I, I, I completely, and I'm, 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 I'm struggling to help you understand my answer, which is my answer to your question is yes. Okay. But I think then, I could just save us some time if I would be allowed to say another sentence or two. Go ahead. Try to keep it brief. I will. I promise you. Even in instances of a man engaging in polygamous marriage, each marriage is separate. He met one man marries one woman. That's the way it works. The scholars then have pointed out that in certain societies, many societies, men of wealth and power then go on to marry additional women. They do not marry as a group. It is not a group marriage. It permits certain men that have access to power to marry more than one woman. Each marriage is a separate marriage of one man and one woman. Let me be sure I understand what you're saying. Um, uh, f first, just as a, a background question, are you aware of instances in which a man has actually married multiple women at the same time? Well, that would be the, the term that would be used as um, 
polyan I mean uh, sorry polyamory uh, gr a group and it, to the best of my knowledge that is uh, I know it is virtually non-present in human experience and to the best of my knowledge there I, I could be mistaken upon this because their history is long and there have been many people who've lived on this earth but I do not think there are examples of group marriages in the human experience. And by group marriages, I just want to be clear, I'm saying where a man marries multiple women at the same time. You're not aware of any instances like that. At the same moment, they all stand together, one man and a bunch of women, and they say, but you're all married women. now. Two or more uh, I am, I, I am, since you're asking me, perhaps you found an example. I am certainly not aware of one. Okay. Uh, now let me uh, turn to what you are aware of, and that is where a man marries more than one woman at different points in time, so-called polygamy, or some situations you're also aware of where a woman may marry more than one uh, man, correct? Well, what that is called is um, I'm asking you what polyandry. It's no, it's, there's an important clarification here because in almost all known examples of polyandry, it's the woman who marries uh, in sequentially two brothers two people who are brothers to one another. And there are cases where, because the sex ratio is so skewed that as a survival uh, t uh, t uh, adaptation for these very rare subgroups, it is permitted uh, for a woman to marry two males who are brothers to one another sequentially. Um. Is it your testimony that the only instances that you are aware of of women marrying more than one man sequentially, but so that after marrying the second one, she was married to two people? The brothers. Is where they were brothers? Is that your testimony? It's my testimony that I'm the... I'm just asking whether that's your testimony. I so. am trying to answer your question. This is a subject This that is a yes or no question. If, if you're going to... We're back to where we were yesterday. If, if oh, you're going to make me choose between those two words, then I'm going to just say uh, it's not a yes or no question. I'm answering the In the time we're arguing about this, I could give you my answer. My answer is that the what best scholarship. No, wait a minute. What question are you answering right now? It seemed to me that you were said, is it your testimony that there are no examples of polyandrous marriages other than the woman marrying the two brothers? And I was seeking to answer that question succinctly. Okay. Now that question is actually the question I was asking you. Yes, sir. Now, can you answer that question, yes or no? If you can't, I'm going to move on because it's not that important. Okay, but then I, let's I, move on because like it does know, not permit a yes or no answer. But I, but, I want, but I want to know whether you're prepared to answer yes or no. I would give a lot if I could have 15 seconds to answer the question. Go. <laughs> the best scholarship available shows that almost all examples of polyandrous marriages involve a woman marrying the two brothers. There are very rare exceptions to that that have been documented by the ethnographic literature. In addition, polyandry as a human phenomenon is extraordinarily rare in the human record. How'd I do? Uh, that was good. That was okay? That was okay. Good. That was okay. Um, uh, now, uh, the reason I didn't want to spend much time on it is because I agree that that's unusual. Um, uh, polygamy, however, um, uh, as you say, was present in 83% of societies, and in those cases... It's a very minority, it's a mi minority family form. Well, I I'm going to ask you about that, uh, and, and I might as well do that now. Um, uh, what percentage of marriages um, prior to the last hundred years 
were uh, polygamous? That is, what percentage of the people were in polygamous marriages as opposed to marriages just between two people? You know, I'm a little embarrassed to tell you. I don't know. Um, but approximately? I honestly don't know. Um, I, I know that my... Well, I'll stop there. I don't know. Okay. Um, uh, now, I, I want to pursue whether polygamous marriages are consistent with your so-called rule of two. A as I understand it... We're now down to so-called? <laughs> well, uh, your rule of two. Uh, but it, it just seems to me that... Well, never mind. Um, I'll put it in the form of a question. Um, if you have a man who has five wives at the same time... He doesn't marry them at the same time. But he has them at the same time. He has After five he's wives. married the fifth, he has five. Right. After he's married one, he has one. After he's married, After two, he's married he's two, two, he has two. That's how it works. And after he has married his fifth wife, assuming they all continue to live and there's been no divorce, he has five wives, right? Yes, sir. Now, it's your testimony that that man with five wives is consistent, that marriage is consistent with what you say is your rule of two. Is that correct? That is a yes or no answer. Based on the findings of the anthropologists who've actually studied this, yes. The answer to your question is yes. And, and, and when you say based on the scholars that have studied this, that's because you're simply repeating the things that these scholars say. Yes, sir. You're just a transmitter of the findings of these scholars, correct? Well, you're putting words in my mouth now. No, sir. Yes, uh, sir. All right, then let's look at uh, your words and your deposition, page 300. I don't believe I do. It's in your, it's in your first book, the book Mr. Cooper gave you. <coughs> in the plaintiff's binder. I might be able to save us time by saying that the substance of your comment is correct. I, I was simply trying to report a view of some scholars. It's the transmitter thing. I, I just was trying to suggest that I was basing I my arguments on, on, on scholarship. Uh, I'm not even saying that there aren't scholars who have a different point of view. I'm saying that there are scholars respected scholars who have made this uh, argument based on ethnographic uh, research. And I've read them, and that's the basis for my assertion. That's all. I understand, and I'm really just addressing whether I was putting words in your mouth. Um, uh, and if you look at page 300, um, uh, lines 7 through 12, and you can read any other portion of this that you that you want, but you have said that you are uh, basing your analysis on the work of highly regarded scholars. And then you say... Oh, a gotcha moment. I used the word, I'm a transmitter of findings of eminent scholars. Gotcha. Okay. That's no, not a gotcha. It's just, I'm just, I'm just I trying said to... I said transmitter seven months ago in a deposition. And, and, and what you meant there was that what you were doing was you weren't making these conclusions on your own, you were simply repeating what the other, these scholars had said. Is that correct? If I may say it in my own words, well, I let was me, let basing... Me look, let me look at your own words on page 300. At line 7 to 12, I'm simply repeating things that they say. I can assure you, I'm not making any of this up on my own. These are not my own conclusions. I'm, I'm a transmitter here of findings of these eminent scholars. Did you give that testimony at your deposition? That's what I said at the deposition. Okay. Um, now, um, I want to be sure that I've got an answer to my question, and if you did answer it, I apologize, sir. But is it your judgment 
that a man who is married at the same time, that is, he has married multiple wives along the way. Sequentially. Sequentially. And he is now married to five women. Each with a separate ceremony and a separate I do. Yes. Um, is it your view that that man who is married one wife and then another wife and then another wife and then another wife and then another wife and now has five wives and they're all his wives at the same time that that marriage is consistent with your rule of two and that is a yes or no question I concur with Bronislaw Malinowski and others who say that that is consistent with the two rule of marriage okay um, uh, now let me um, uh, go on to your third essential structure of the institution of marriage, uh, and that is sex. That's um, a good subject. It is. Um, uh, and um, I, d I don't want to fall into the trap of making sex boring. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Maybe are, together we can do uh, that. Yeah, my, <laughs> 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 uh, my, 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 no insinuations. I, <laughs> my question. My, my, my question was. Uh, going to be and is now uh, whether you are aware of um, uh, instances in which marriage marriages are entered into they're inconsistent with your rule of sex uh, I'm sorry you you're saying the couple is married and they do not have sexual intercourse am I aware of such marriages well uh, that actually wasn't my question, but why don't you answer that question, because that's really easy, right? The answer to that's yes, correct? I, I was going to answer no, but maybe I'm misunderstanding the nature of your question. Right. The, the presumption, the presumption of, of 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 sex, is is one of the foundational elements of marriage, and failure to consummate the marriage through sexual intercourse in the overwhelming majority of societies in both law and customs are, a custom is grounds for divorce. Let me let me. That's why we have terms like the marriage bed, culminating the marriage. That's what happens. They, the couple gets married and then they have sexual intercourse. So it's your testimony that you're not aware of any married couples who don't have sex. <laughs> well, here we go. Going to make it boring again. Of, are there some married couples in the world today who have never had sexual intercourse? Oh my gosh. Well, uh, I suppose just thinking hypothetically, I'm trying to think. Um, well, if, you, if you're not aware could, of them, there I'm could not be asking you to there could be an example, say, of an incarcerated man who marries while he's in incarceration. It could be true that the system he's in is one of the minority of systems that does not produce, allow for conjugal visits, and he will not be able to consummate a sexual relationship with his wife until he is released from prison, and during the time that he is in prison and married and unable to have a conjugal visit, I guess it's possible or likely that that man will have not had sexual intercourse with his wife by virtue of incarceration and he will have to wait until after he's released or he'll have to wait until the, the period of a conjugal visit. That would be an example or you might have examples of a, of a husband and wife who, who simply don't like sex, they don't want to have sex, it's not of interest to them or they don't hold it as a valuable component of anything in life and so they may wish to get married for for other reasons having nothing to do with sex and so they may just 
be one of these uh, couples. I've never met one. Uh, I'm not aware of it being at all a pattern in humans. In fact, I believe the pattern is entirely in the opposite direction. But um, hypothetically, could there be such a case? I suppose there could. Well, sir, um, you know perfectly well that these are not sort of just hypothetical cases. Correct, sir? Um, no, sir. I don't. You, d you don't like this, this example of the incarcerated prisoner? Um, you know perfectly well that that's a real example from a real court case, don't you, sir? No, sir, I do not. You don't? Why would you try to put words in my mouth of that nature? Well, um, um, uh, because it is my uh, understanding that you have previously um, recognized um, that uh, this very specific example of where uh, the United States Supreme Court held that you could not deprive um, somebody of the right to marry merely because they were incarcerated and could not have sex. And I thought that you had talked about that. And if you tell me that that's not so, um, and, before, and I can't and To find the best it. of my ability, I mean, to the best of my recollection, I'm telling you that that is not so. You're, so you're not aware of that case at all? No, sir. No. no. Okay. I'm not saying that in the course of a lifetime, somebody has never said anything to me about it. I just have no recollection of it. Okay. Um, uh, so, other than, and I, I don't want you to hypothesize. Other than hypothetical examples, I have talked about issues of, of, of I have thought about and in conversation with others talked about the issue of prisoners uh, who who marry. I have talked about that, but I'm not aware of. Uh, I'm not a student of court. I don't know what year the court case. Was. I'm not even aware that okay. this thing that you're right. talking about. All right. Let, let me. Um, uh, approach it this way. I'm not asking you to hypothesize. I'm just asking you whether you are, you are aware of any examples of marriages that are inconsistent with your rule of sex. If you're not aware of them, I don't want you to hypothesize or try to think up what might exist. Just are you aware of any examples or not? No, sir. Okay. Um, I, let Sorry, me, may I just clarify? You're asking me, am I aware of an individual marriage case, an individual married couple that has that has not consummated their marriage through s sexual intercourse? Is that is is that your question? Um, no. Um, my 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 question. Um, was whether you were aware of any examples of uh, marriages that were inconsistent with your rule of sex. Um, rule now, of sex? Yeah, yeah. yeah now, now, now um, I was just asking if you were asking me of an individual couple, that I know of an individual couple who had not consummated their marriage through sexual intercourse. Let, let, me, let me approach it this way, okay? I, I'm not aware of such a couple. Okay, well... Okay, let me approach it this way, because this has gone on long enough where I have found the deposition that I thought existed. Uh, would you turn to page 258 of your deposition? And at... Um, uh, beginning at line 13... But in any society, if a man and woman want to marry and not have sex at all, and neither one seek divorce, they're free to do that, right? Answer. Well, you know the law on this has changed in recent decades. And now in recent years, there has been a growing permission on the part of courts to accept married couples who cannot have sexual intercourse, for example, with one spouse is imprisoned. Do you see that, sir? 
exactly what I told you in my answer. This doesn't say it's hypothetical, does it, sir? You're not I talking I did not use I did not I don't think I used the word hypothetical in my answer. I said there's a, I said in cases where a prisoner is unable to consummate his marriage, he would have to depend upon uh, getting out of prison to do so, or conjugal visits. I think that's what I said. And then you said, oh, no, there's a specific court case. And I said, I'm not aware of a specific court case, which I'm not. I do know that the courts allow, I, I believe as a matter of being a generally informed person, that courts allow, many courts, I don't know, every court, I don't know, many courts allow prisoners to marry. And it's a topic of interest to me as a person interested in marriage. And I have the level of knowledge as adumbrated in this definition, which is not a deep one, but I know that prisoners are allowed to marry. And I know that in order to consummate the marriage, they would have to wait until they get out of prison and until, or, or if they are in a system that allows conjugal visits. That's all I know. I'm not aware of specific court cases that have or haven't done this. I, I know that it's been a tendency on the part of the courts, or at least some courts, to, to allow prisoners to marry. Uh, it's not my area of expertise. I just, that's my level of knowledge. But it is clear, is it not, that the growing permission on the part of courts to accept married couples who cannot have sexual intercourse, for example, with one sp when one spouse is imprisoned, is something that exists today. It's not a hypothetical situation. Correct, sir? I don't think I ever said it I'm was hypothetical. I'm not asking you whether you ever said it or not. I think the record will show whatever it shows. Um, all I'm asking you now is... If you're asking me if they're prisoners who can marry, the answer, to my best knowledge, is yes. Even when they cannot have sexual intercourse, correct? Well, they get out of prison. Well, and if they're in, in for life, they never get out of prison, right? Well, if they're in life, and they're in prison for life, and they're in a system that does not allow any conjugal visits, I would have to consult experts to find out if there is a human being in the country who is in such a situation. He's in prison for life, he's married, and he is not in a system in which any conjugal visitation is allowed. And if there were, I don't know whether there is such a person, but if there were, then it would be true that that person would be a married person who cannot consummate his marriage through sexual intercourse. That's my answer to your question. And at your deposition on November 3, 2009, you say, the law on this has changed in recent decades. And now, in recent years, there has been a growing permission on the part of courts to accept married couples who cannot have sexual intercourse, for example, with one spouse is imprisoned. Correct? That's what you said on November 3, 2009. Correct? That is a yes. I, no. y yes, that's, yes. I'm not looking at a transcript right now, but I, yes, that's what I said. And... It is your testimony that you have never looked at any court cases that address whether or not prisoners can marry, correct? To the very best of my recollection and memory, I have never consulted by uh, reading anything a court document that is related to the topic that we are discussing. I'm not saying I never have. I have been in work reading things for a long time, but to the best of my knowledge, I have never read a court document that is specifically focused on this topic. And if I ever have, then I've forgotten it. But I don't really honestly don't think I have. I have had conversations with people who are lawyers about the, uh, I don't even know at which level this thing gets decided, but I, I know that there is a tendency to allow more freedom. I believe, I believe that there is a tendency to allow prisoners more freedom than was heretofore the case to marry. and. Uh, that's about as far as I was trying to go in my, my deposition statement. 
What I'm focusing on now, sir, is in your study of marriage, um, have you come across cases from the United States Supreme Court that talk about marriage as a fundamental right of all people? Have you come across any cases that discuss that? That is a yes or no question. By come across, do you mean have I read read something that the courts have written? Let's start with that. Have you read any Supreme Court opinions that discuss marriage as a fundamental right? Just yes or no. Well, I to the or best I don't to the best of my knowledge, the answer is no. Okay. Now, has any person summarized for you the holdings of the United States Supreme Court in cases that discuss the fundamental right to marry? I believe the answer to that is yes, because if someone, you or someone, were to ask me, is it my understanding that the Supreme Court has stated at some point in time, at any point in time, has used the term fundamental right to marry and has articulated a fundamental right to marry, my answer would be that, that I, I believe I believe that the Supreme Court has stated such a right, and it would be my, I would not be surprised to learn that that were true. I would be happy to I, learn that it's true, but it's I, not, I'm not, I don't, I'm not basing it on sure knowledge of having read any document. I, I'm not asking you whether you'd be surprised by it. I'm, I'm just trying to ask you whether you are aware of it and whether you've considered that in, in your work. That, that's all I was trying to get at. Um, uh, and having talked about it this far, does it refresh your recollection that somebody has talked to you about the United States Supreme Court holding that prisoners had a fundamental right to marry even if they were not able to have sex? Does that refresh your recollection that you've either been told that or read that? No, sir. I, okay. to the best of my knowledge, have never been told that or have never read that, to okay. the best of my recollection. Okay. Um, let me uh, turn into another subject. Um, um, and let me ask you to look at tab eight. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, All right. <clears throat> Can we resume at uh, five minutes of the hour? Yes, Your Honor. All right, fine.